Behind the fighting power of any nation is its spirit. For centuries, the people of the Netherlands have been creating the tradition that today inspires their fight for freedom. We all know the outward appearances of that tradition, tulips, windmills, and wooden shoes. But what lies behind these surfaces? What is the spirit that moves every Dutchman in the world today, that was built into the very walls of their distinctive homes, that was painted on canvas by the world-famous Dutch masters hundreds of years ago, that crossed the ocean to the new world and still stands out in an America that it helped to create? In Michigan's town of Holland, we can see the marks of a Dutch origin more easily than we can find them in a huge and ever-changing metropolis like New York. The people show the strong personal character developed by a lifetime of devotion to simple duties, even though the chores have changed to accommodate a machine age. All of the surface signs that would make it just think he was in Holland But the spiritual legacy is the most important. Let us seek the spirit in yesterday's Holland, the country that substituted modern liners for the sailing ships that pioneered the world's trade routes, the country whose standard of living gave it the world's lowest death rate, in the tiny country that won Nobel Prizes times and led the world in providing housing for its industrial workers whose ancient canals are flanked on one side by motor express highways and on the other by the swiftest of diesel-electric railroads. In the 20th century, the Flying Dutchman was no legend. He was the enterprising pilot whose routine job took him round the world several times a month. In the victories of peace, we were given a hint of what we might expect from Dutchmen at war. In our own time, they proved what civilized man could do in his age-old battle to control his environment. Needing more land to support a growing population, they turned not against their neighbors, but against their traditional foe, the sea. They worked night and day for 20 years so that they could farm where once they had fished. No other people can look at their map with the same sense of this we made with our own hands. The Zyder Zeep holders are new, but a quarter of this whole country was made in the same way. It isn't large by some standards, but it housed eight million and served as the center of a kingdom that stretched clear around the world. The Netherlands East Indies alone had a pre-war population of 70 million and a land area that surprises those who thought of the South Sea Islands as romantic pinpoints on a world map. A study of Holland's peacetime record in these islands offers another clue to the Dutch tradition. The Indies represented wealth, untold wealth. But in modern times, the Dutch administrative policy has been based on the principle of stewardship rather than ownership of that wealth. Exploitation of the islanders' land was forbidden by law. Large sums were spent on an educational system that respected both local custom and the needs of modern life. The islands were developed, not milked, and for that very reason grew in importance in the economic life of the kingdom. Gradually, a system of representative government was introduced. First, 300 self-ruling territories were established. Later, a people's council provided the means of popular expression on political and economic matters. And the same democratic tradition shaped Dutch administration in the West Indies. In Curaçao and Suriname, freedom was nurtured, and it yielded rich dividends in progressive peoples. 
the Netherlands became a symbol of peace. It seemed natural to establish the Court of International Arbitration in a Dutch city. For an entire century, Holland remained aloof from the warfare of its European neighbors. And then to Dutch ears came the swelling sound of a war that was to expose still another aspect of the Dutch tradition. At first, peace-loving Holland hoped to remain neutral. With a total population not much bigger than that of the city of New York, she could scarcely afford to take steps against a Germany that was building a great war machine. But there is a difference between neutrality and appeasement. Holland was determined to defend her land and her people against invasion. She entered a period of armed neutrality, during which she marshaled all of her limited resources. Army leaves were canceled, fortifications were strengthened, an entire nation was put on the alert. She listened to German promises to respect her neutrality, but made sure the tank barriers were prepared and that her border guards were on 24-hour duty. Dutchmen rallied round their queen in a unanimous movement of national will, and at the same time, took the greatest trouble to avoid an incident that would give Germany an excuse for declaring war. But the conquest-mad Nazis needed no incident. Behind the barbed wire fences that they strung along the border, they were manufacturing their own excuses. At three o'clock in the morning of May 10, 1940, a century of Dutch peace came to an end. That morning, the Blitz was born. That morning, the Nazis unsheathed the mechanized sword that would enslave a continent before it was shattered. That morning, Dutch blood ran into the canals as the small force of free men fought to save their fields and their homes. Dutch marksmen shot straight, and that morning the first of that self-appointed master race had the honor of dying for their Führer. The sun came up on a nation fighting for its life, behind a flooded countryside and a wall of stubborn determination to be free. But then the Nazis struck their master stroke. They hurtled the floods and the wall as well. The Luftwaffe was unveiled to a shocked world. An army came floating out of the sky and penetrated the hard-held lines of defense. They destroyed communications and wrecked transport. They sowed confusion and prevented the execution of elaborate plans that had been expected to stop them. And such held out, making the trespasser bleed for every kilometer he advanced. The city of Rotterdam was methodically blown to bits. There was no opposition now. This was a maniac's holiday. But with North Holland gone and the eastern provinces overrun by the enemy, there was still Zeeland in the south. The core of resistance was shifted to the island province already under heavy air attack. Britain and France both sent help, but it came too late. The body of the Dutch army was cut off, and the Allies soon turned south in an effort to seek a stronger line on which to stop the invader. Holland's sovereign, determined to fight on and cut off from Zeeland by enemy action, succeeded in reaching the friendly shores of England where she was joined by her government. And the fight did go on. In the Indies, Holland had much to fight for and much to fight with. Over 70 million loyal subjects of the Netherlands Kingdom were still free to carry on the battle.
many of the island's agricultural products, including tea and rice, hemp and tapioca, that had found peacetime markets throughout the world, were now sorely needed in the defense economies of many lands. 93% of the world's supply of quinine was still being produced in Java. The long and careful cultivation of the rubber tree in the Indies would now yield a precious harvest to Holland's allies. Tin was only one of the strategic metals found in abundance in the islands. Most important of all the items in this treasure chest was oil. What food is to men, so is oil to the robots of modern war. And the Japanese, preparing for their career of treachery, came seeking the East Indian oil with touching protestations of goodwill. They offered treaties and toothbrushes and finally, even gold. Their visit was marked with extreme formality and achieved nothing. The Dutch weren't doing business with Hirohito. The agency had left behind to disrupt local life and to transmit information of interest to the Japanese high command were soon trapped and put away in fitting cages. The peoples of the islands were rallied to their defense. There was trouble brewing and no time to lose. An alert people under resourceful leadership went into action to preserve their freedom. There was much to be done, but not so much that the needs of a friendly neighbor could not be cared for. The death of Greece and Libya. And in the meantime, the arming of the islands went on at top speed. In 1940 and 41, Dutch purchasing commissions placed $500 million worth of orders in America, all to be paid for in cash. And by the summer of 41, East Indians were carrying out defense maneuvers in American-made trucks and splashing through the rice sours in tanks that had at last solved the problem of military transport over this difficult terrain. And then... While the fires were still burning at Hickam Field, the Netherlands Kingdom declared war on Japan. For a week, the Dutch forces had been at attention. A few hours after the first bombs fell on the decks of the West Virginia, Dutch flyers were ranging over the Pacific and destroying enemy submarines. At home, the islanders, long since turned from their traditional arts to the sterner crafts of war, hurried to supply their fighters with the materials of destruction. In the grim campaigns of the Malayan Peninsula, the Dutch Air Force played an important part. They knew the seas through which the Japanese were sending reinforcements, and they used that knowledge to destroy at least one Jap ship every day. For two months, the sinkings continued at this temple, and then the Dutch ran out of planes. But an invasion fleet was reported approaching Java, and the Dutch sailed to meet it. In the ensuing battle, begun with the now famous phrase of Admiral Duerman, follow me, I am attacking, the small navy won the praise of the world for the gallantry of its suicidal stand against overwhelming odds. But the bravery of fighting men and the intrepid leadership of their commanders were not sufficient to stop an enemy that had been preparing for 20 years to carry out this particular act of geographical plunder and mass murder. The Jap hordes landed and fought their way through the islands hill by hill. The islanders contested every inch of the advance, but they were no match for the experienced veterans of China's race. The Japs reached the East Indian oil fields but it was a journey in vain. The Dutch had seen to that. In London, the Dutch government met in this moment of defeat to plan the fight on other fronts. This was in the Dutch tradition once again. In Canada, around a nucleus of those who had escaped from Holland and the East Indies, a training center was established for the rebuilding of the Dutch army. Young men came from all corners of the earth to join its ranks.
twice in two years, this army had met defeat. But its daily resolve was to engage the enemy a third time. These men did not sit and talk of future victory. They worked for it. After their initial training period in Canada, they went on to more intensive maneuvers in England, where they practiced the invasion tactics which will get them back to their homes across the channel. In the south of the United States, their brothers are finding wings. The Dutchmen who learned about air power the hardest way look forward to the day when they will teach their teachers the last lesson. And in the meantime, they are flying out of Australian bases to practice on Jap Zeros. In the Western Hemisphere, where the Dutch flag still flies over free Dutch soil, the soldiers of the Netherlands are at their posts. Some have found their way across the world from Java and add one more race to the already varied population of Suriname and Curaçao. Suriname, or Dutch Guiana, is part of the mainland of South America. The other territories of the Netherlands West Indies are islands in the Caribbean Sea. For an America defending her home shores in a global war, these islands assumed major military importance. The Dutch government invited its good neighbor, the United States, to use these territories as defense outposts. Under a combined command of Dutch and American officers, they became formidable bastions in the system of hemisphere defense. Dutch and American troops swarmed over the exotic landscapes, always on the alert. The daily maneuvers under realistic combat conditions helped to build fighting units that can defend the islands against all comers and will be prepared to take the offensive when the time comes. Suriname is important for still another reason. Bauxite, the source of aluminum, is its principal export product. To an America building thousands of planes a year, this yellow clay has almost the value of gold. It is the stuff that wings are made of. Americans at home and abroad are depending on this jungle source for their air might. And American troops are peering into tropical undergrowth as they help guard the cargoes constantly moving from Suriname to the assembly lines of American war plants. And some of the planes make their way back to the Indies, for Suriname and Curaçao are important transport bases in the new air networks that have been spun around a warring world. And American-made airplanes are on constant duty patrolling the sea approaches to both North and South America and the sea lanes over which the bauxite, rubber, and oil are flowing northward. The oil, too, comes from the Netherlands West Indies. The great refineries on Curaçao and Aruba are working day and night in the front line of the United Nations Battle of Supply. A petroleum cracking plant has none of the noise and confusion of a battlefield, yet many of the victories of World War II are decided in this setting, where tanks get strength to attack, where planes get their speed, where warships get the drive to push them through the seas. An oil refinery is the heart of a modern army depending on air power to press the attack. It is not surprising that an oil tank in Aruba was the first target of German shelling in the Western Hemisphere. It is not surprising that boys from Ohio and Vermont stand sentry duty over an objective so important to their country's welfare. While boys from Bonandam and Friesland speed through Caribbean waters to chase submarines preying on the oil tankers. To these sons of fishermen who have plied the North Seas for centuries, the quest for the undersea marauder has all the elements of a game. But it is a grim game, played in all weathers, in fragile craft, that are pitted against an unscrupulous enemy. Dutch and American naval officers are proud that the Caribbean patrol operations have been called models of international cooperation. In July 1942, 298 years after the first Roosevelt came to America from Zeeland, 
the President of the United States turned over a new submarine chaser to Wilhelmina, Queen of the Netherlands, with these words. Your Majesty, from the earliest days of history, the people of the Netherlands, your people, have been willing to fight for their freedom and independence. They have won out in the face of great odds. Once more, they are fighting for that independence. Once more, they will win and maintain it. And so one more ship joined the survivors of the Dutch Navy that are today shooting down the vultures threatening the lifelines of the democracy. Day by day, the total of German planes shot out of the air by Dutch gunners mounts. And the number of Jap ships shot out of the water by Dutch torpedoes increases. The tradition of the nation that once ruled the seven seas is maintained in our own time by veteran seamen under the renowned Admiral Helfrich. And in the Allied Merchant Navy, the story is the same. In every United Nations port, one can find the Dutch seamen just in from the long voyage. A few years ago, they shipped out of Batavia with spices, or out of Amsterdam with cheese. Today, they toast their good luck on the routes from Halifax to Murmansk, or from Boston, Persian Gulf, carrying cargoes of jeeps and bombs, and lend-lease food. And they pay tribute to their brothers who were not among the survivors. Their cargoes are not all carried in holes. Dutch seamen are ferrying American troops on a tour of conquest through the islands of the South Pacific. And Dutch ships, manned by Dutch crews, played a part in the most dramatic troop movement of the war, the landing of the American and English armies on the shores of North Africa. Was this action merely a rehearsal for even more spectacular crossings still to come? In the Netherlands, an enslaved people is waiting for the day of liberation. They read the German rules of oppression, but their hope has not been destroyed, nor their spirit vanquished. They can still manage to strike at the usurper. News of an important Nazi rail shipment is sent through the underground to waiting pilots in England. The message signals the start of another joint action as fearless men of two nations work together in common cause. and no sense of false hope, inspires their queen to talk about a Netherlands Commonwealth after a war which has not yet been won on the battlefield. The sense of victory comes from the indomitable spirit, the once laughed at stubbornness of the Dutch. They were winning that war in the very way they took their temporary defeats in the first two years. Territory by territory, with no thought of color or class or creed, Old and young are winning tomorrow's Commonwealth today. Mm -hmm.